as the kids are exiting, just want to take a second to uh, open up with a word of prayer before we dive into God's word. So join me for a word of prayer real quick, okay? Father, thank you for the opportunity to engage your word. Um, Father, what we do not know, teach us. Father, what we are not, make us. And maybe it to the glory of Jesus Christ. May we learn from, from Saul's mistakes here today. Uh, Father, may we internalize some principles of, of the right way to do things that, are, that bring glory to your Son and betterment to our lives. And Father, just teach us, illuminate the text, and uh, make us your people that are more whole. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in um, 1 Samuel. Right, 1 Samuel chapter 28. This is a piece of land a few people have been looking forward to uh, because we're going to be talking about witches and goblins. No, just kidding. But witches for certain, not goblins, but witches for certain. Spiritism, mediums, and all that kind of thing. We're going to try to be good and gracious about it. But really the bigger piece of the passage of the sermon I've called Death by Inches is about what happens when we don't take care of the details of our lives, right? Now, how many of you are Bronco fans? It's okay if you're not. I'll forgive you for that, and Jesus does too. But if you're a Bronco fan, you know they have their big game tomorrow night against 49ers, right? So I, this like this preseason has gone on like for eternity, okay? But they have their third game tomorrow night, and uh, Vic Fangio, if you're a fan of his, he's the new head coach of the Broncos. He's been a big defensive coordinator in the NFL for, I don't know, a couple decades. And something that he said in his press conference in the springtime that he is, I've heard him say when he was with the Chicago Bears, when he was with the Colts, when he was with the 49ers, when he was with the Jaguars, he said this before, and that is, we are not going to be a team that is going to die a death by inches. Now, first when you hear that, you say, uh, what's that all about? Well, what it's all about is when we don't take care of the details of life, when we don't take care of the details of life, they have a way of bringing us down, right? So let's jump into the text of 1 Samuel 28, and we're going to kind of see a little bit of this in the life of Saul. As all the details he hasn't taken care of, now we're going to mount into one big thing, and before we see his death in chapter 31, we're going to see him hit rock bottom here in 28, okay? So this is what it says in chapter 28 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, that remember, he's the, he's the king of the Philistines, right? You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in your army. If you missed this before, David's hiding out among the Philistines so that Saul doesn't come get him. And he's earned trust, though he's deceiving the king of, Ach- of uh, the Philistines, Achish. David said, then you will see for yourself that your, what your servant can do. And Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now that's the transition from last week's sermon to this one. But suddenly in the middle of the program, that we're watching, boom, here's a story about Saul and the medium. And you say, how does that transition? Because we just left David, and we're going to see David in, liberate Ziklag in the, in the next chapter. But so what, what, what's this here? So we're going to try to tie these things together, starting in verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all of Israel mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came to set up camp at Shunem, where Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. Verse 5, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Verse 7, Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so that I may go and inquire of her. Well, there is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and his men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one that I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know that Saul, now obviously she couldn't recognize him as close, Surely you know that Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord. Isn't it interesting? As he's committing gross sin... He is swearing by the Lord Almighty. He's using the Lord's name in vain. We do that all the time, right? He swears to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. Then the woman said to Samuel, she, I'm sorry, then the woman saw Samuel. She cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see a ghostly figure. 
Actually, it means literally in the Hebrew, I see a little God, right, coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Verse 16, he's not going to like the response here. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. Now see, the judgment's coming. The hammer's dropping. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Boy, that doesn't sound very good, does it? The Lord will also give the army of the Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Verse 20, immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day or in all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. But Saul refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. So he got up from the ground and sat on the couch. And the woman had a fatted calf at the house, which she butchered at once. And she took some flour, kneaded it, and baked some bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. And that same night they got up and left. Now immediately when you're looking at this text, we're thinking a little bit, you're saying, Greg, open this up with the Broncos, Coach, and death by inches. What's it got to do with Saul? And how is Saul in the middle of two discussions of David? David hiding among the Philistines, and then David leaving out among the Philistines and liberating Ziklag in chapter 29. So, so what's the deal with Saul right in the middle? Remember this entire book juxtapositions two people, two people, one that represents God and one that represents life without God. David, the man after God's own heart, is a representation of life with God. And so he's on both sides of this. But if you're going to have a good picture of a hero, you have to have a good picture of a who? A villain. And the bad guy of life without God is Saul. And so Saul, in this horrible story of the witch of Endor, is dropped right into the middle between these two chapters about David. And it's going to juxtaposition David and Saul again like it has many times before. And so we're going to see that the details in life matter, right? The details of obeying God and trusting God matter versus not doing them. The details of making life part of your daily, making God part of your daily life matter versus not doing those things. The details of obeying God and even the small commandments, such as seeking out witchcraft and a medium, they matter because there's some pretty severe consequences that are coming on the scenes. It shows that life and the details in our Christian life really, really do matter. Okay, so there's, as we look at this text a little bit this morning, I just want you to walk with me a little bit as we look at a few different things, okay? It's kind of an obscure passage, but when we read it, a number of believers who've been reading through 1 Samuel have said, Greg, what is the deal with this? How do we, what do we do with this? Okay, and why is it in there? Well, it's about learning from the life of Saul. So just a couple things here. First of all, the first principle is Saul teaches us when we're not taking care of the details, right? that we need to live lives daily seeking God's face and direction in His Word. The first principle is we need to live lives daily seeking God, His face, and His Word, okay? Now Saul in this passage, does, is he seeking God? It looks like it for a minute, right? He tries to, to use the Urim and, and this, that, and the other and get a word from the Lord, but truly in his heart, as we're going to see, he hasn't done that. He's not living daily. As we've walked through the book of 1 Samuel, would you say Saul was a man that daily followed the heart of God? Would you say that? No. He's living life away from God, right? He's living life away from God. Let's just look what it says, verse 3, 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his town of Ramah. This is to make sure that we understand that Samuel is dead and is in the ground. Because when we see him called up by the medium... 
people are going to say, well, he wasn't really dead. Well, he's dead, right? Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. That's to tell us that Saul knew what the, the teaching of God were, that in the book of Deuteronomy, that it was considered by God that if you engaged in witchcraft, if you engaged in sorcery, if you engaged in mediums or spiritism or divination or all those different things, that that was considered this great and horrible sin. In fact, it was a sin on the level that if people engaged in those things, if they were witches and warlocks and that kind of thing, they would be killed because it would infect the people. Now, you've got to understand the cultures at that time, that this was a big deal. The Canaanite cultures that we talked about last week, when David was dealing horribly with the Gershites and the Jebusites and all that, they really got into this stuff. Remember, I said they were really bad dudes, right? But, but Saul... God's chosen king shouldn't be part of that. Well, let's pick it up at verse 4. The Philistines assembled and came up, camp Asherim, and then Saul gathered at Gilboa and saw where the Philistine are, and he saw it, and he was afraid, and terror filled his heart. Verse 6, but he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his ascendants, find me a woman who is a medium so that I may inquire of her, and they said, there is one in Endor. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman, and he says, consult a spirit for me, that he may bring up the one to whom I name. This is the issue here. Saul has no time for God. He doesn't seek God daily. He's not looking for his face. He's not in his word. He's not listening to the prophets. When Samuel told him to do something like wipe out the Amalekites before, did he obey God? No. He's a man after his own heart that does what he wants to do. He's the true Frank Sinatra that did it his way, right? And so he's the man that says, hey, God's telling me this, but, mm, you know, this would be more advantageous for me politically. God's saying this, but mm, this would be better for me in my harem. Or, or God's telling me to do this, and mm, I, this would be more strategically or tactically advantage for me as a general, right? He's a guy living without God, but when he's put in the vice, when God allows him to be put in the vice, which is the Philistines. Now, what you don't understand, without looking it up and studying it, is that where the Philistines are at at Shunem, it's way far north. So I'm going to try to make it simple for you. Basically, what the Philistines are doing, and they've kind of been a mess for, for Saul for a little while, right? They're the great enemy of God at this time. They want to deal the death blow. They want to do the atomic bomb to the Israelites. They want to drop fat man and little boy on them. So they march up way north out of their territory, and they invade this valley. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to cut off Saul from all his northern tribes of his men and his soldiers. He's basically doing an Inchon maneuver out of the, out of the Korean War. He's cutting Saul's forces in half so they can dominate them. You destroy one side, then you destroy the other. And we're going to see that they're pretty successful in chapter 1 because Saul and his sons die, just like the Lord says. He falls. So Saul is very afraid. And, and so now that he's in the pinch, right? God often has to put us in the pinch to get our attention. Now suddenly, he wants to inquire of the Lord, verse 6. But God doesn't what? God doesn't answer him. Not by dreams, which is one way of learning the Lord's will at that time. Not by Urim, which was these stones that you cast lots. And the Lord revealed his will through that. That was normal for the priest to do. But he didn't have to do that because what did he do with him at Nob? He had slaughtered all the priests of the Lord at the town of Nob earlier in this, in this book. And so God doesn't come to him in dreams. God doesn't come to him by the urim. He's, he's casting the lots. And the prophets, Samuel's dead. And the other prophets, God's not telling him anything. Why is that? Because Saul has no room for God in the day-to-day. -day. And so when he's suddenly put in the pinch... And now he comes to God, God's like, mm, no. This is how you respond to me all the time, mm, no. And now it's my turn to say, mm, no to you. And so Saul finds himself without hearing anything from God. He finds himself without hearing from the Lord. And that's what I want you to pay attention to, is that when we live a lifestyle of the world, and when we don't make any room for God in our lives day to day, week to week, month to month, that we put ourselves in a position where we do that long enough where maybe when it's time for us to turn to the Lord, we don't know the Lord, we can't hear His voice 
because we haven't been training ourselves to hear from him. Did you hear that? If you decide to live life in real time, away from the Lord, a lifestyle of this world without God, and people do this all the time, church people do this all the time, in essence, they live godless lives, they live little room for God in their lives, and without God being part of their lives, you're not daily, regularly training yourselves to know the mind of the Lord, to hear the voice of the Lord, because if you're active in studying the Word of God, if you're active in a prayer life, if you're active in your church, if you're active in sharing your faith, with other people, if you're active in your discipleship of growing to be a follower of Christ, then you're training yourself as you study this book, as you hear the word of the Lord, to know what God's voice sounds like. But if you spend your life without this book, without listening to the voice of the Lord, and then you find yourself in a pinch, when you go to the Lord, even if the Lord's speaking to you, you have no clue that he's doing so. Because it's not God's mouth that's a problem, it's your ears. Did you hear that? You're not in a position to understand what you're doing. It's like you show up at a football game and you've never practiced it down in your life. You throw on some pads, you run out there, and you have no clue what you're doing, and you're running all the wrong plays. You don't know what the, the coach is saying. He's saying, run this and run that. You don't know what any of the symbols mean. And that's exactly what Saul is like. He has no idea. you know. And, and a lot of people in this life kind of live their lives a little bit like that. They kind of live their lives one foot in and one foot out. I'll go to church, I'll do a little bit of Jesus, I'll do a little bit of this, and I'll do a little bit of my faith, and I'll do a little bit of that, and if I do a little bit of that, then I'll be fine in everything else. But you're truly not seeking out God. You're truly not getting to know the heart of God. You're truly not getting to hear the voice of God and knowing your God. And when it comes time for you to need God, God may be there, but you'll have no clue that he's speaking to you. God may be there to help you, but you'll have no clue of how to access him. Because you will not be practicing the skills ahead of time. It's like anything else in our life. You have to practice the skills ahead of time, right? And you have to become consistent in them. If you want to understand the will of the Lord, you have to practice talking to him, spending time with him in prayer, and listening as a culture, we're very good at doing what I'm doing right now, which is talking. We're very poor at what most of the time we should be doing, which is listening, what you guys are doing. To really understand not just what's said up here in words, but what is the meaning underneath the words. What's often called in communications theory, meta-narratives or meta-communication. When I discuss something with my wife, how many of you enjoy male-female communication? Guys, how many of you enjoy male-female communication? <laughs> the pastor's stoned. He's been out playing out here in these plants out in the fields. Man, come on, right? I mean, Kim and I have almost been married for 29 years in January, and it's just like, you know, I would think, I mean, we haven't really changed that much. I should understand what she's saying. I should understand her heart. I should get what she's trying to tell me. She speaks well. Everybody else around her understands. But somehow when we're talking, it just kind of falls apart, right? Something simple like the food list. How many of you guys have fun getting the food list, right? They text you the food list or they call you and tell you, go to the store and get this. Something simple. Women are laughing because they know this is true. Something simple. And dude, I still get it wrong. It's not like I'm not trying, but I still get it wrong, right? And so the point of married life and communication is to get to know each other's souls so well over time that you finally get that down. Well, obviously, 29 years isn't enough for me. God's going to have to give me another 29 years, right? But I'm trying, and I'm still in the game, and I'm still focused on Kim, and I still listen, and I still talk. And I try to understand, I turn off the TV, I put my phone down, I do everything like I'm supposed to, I square off, I look her in the eye, I have my ears on, and I do all the stuff, and she's talking right. But it's just that male-female thing, right? Sometimes, let's be honest with each other, let's be real here about our faith. Isn't it sometimes that way when you pray? Sometimes when you pray, you're talking, God's talking, but somehow in there, it's just hard to kind of figure out what he's saying. And so the life of a believer, a follower of God, is 
it has to have a daily time with the Lord. It has to have a daily time listening to Him speak to you in the Word, talking to Him in prayer, just sitting and listening to Him talk to your heart in prayer. Just doing those things. You have to build in time for that. Like you build in time for that in your marriage. Or like you build in time for your children. Or you build in time for other people, the people you supervise at your work, whatever. You have to build in time to listen to God. And to say, well, I'm so busy at work. I'm so busy with family life. I'm so busy with whatever. That's not going to cut it. That's why the divorces rack up. Is because we don't attend to our married lives. We can be doing good things. Good things. I can be out shooting or fishing or whatever else. Those are good things. I can even take my kids with me. Those are good things. But if that's robbing time with my wife, it can cost me my relationship with her. Amen? Now, none of those things are bad. In fact, she supports me doing those things. But if I do so much of those things, then I'm not building that relationship with her day in and day out. I think you guys get the point. Same way with God. Saul had no room for God in his life, right? His life's orientation was not Godward. Saul's life orientation was not Godward. You need to ask yourself this question. Is my daily life orientation God-centered? Is my daily life, with all that I do, is it God-word? It's about the direction of my heart, amen? It's about the direction of my heart. It's not like God wants all your time, but He wants some of your time. And He wants you to be thinking about Him and thinking about His heart. Because when you're in this book, you're learning God's heart. If you're just reading it for information, I said this last week, you're missing something. You should be reading it for formation, for God to be shaping your heart. Over 29 years, my wife has been very successful in shaping my heart in a certain way. In my interactions with her, she's made me more merciful and more patient and more kind. Believe me, there's a lot of work to be done still. But she still moved me in the right direction because I'm Kim Word-centered, right? As a married man to her. We have to be God-Word-oriented in directionality. We have to be God-Word-centered and if you make God the center of your life, the principle from earlier in this book, when you honor God, He honors you, kicks in. Now, if you don't honor God, and if you don't consistently seek Him, if you're not making Him the center of your life, then when it comes time for the pinch in your life, why does God have to show up? See, I think a lot of times, if we're honest with ourselves and people discussing things, counseling, discipleship, spiritual formation, whatever we want to put on it, in dealing with each other in real life, I think we think if we do these things, then God owes me. If I go to church, if I read my Bible, if I pray, if I give my tithes and my offerings, if I kick in and help out at vacation Bible school, if I go to the men's retreat, if I do these things, then God owes me. No. If I do certain things with my wife, she doesn't owe me. Does she have a duty to me because I do certain things for her? No. It's a heart thing. Remember, when we began to study of 1 Samuel, it's about the heart. It's not about duty. It's not about religion. It's about the heart. And so everything that we see here with, with Saul is a failure of the heart. His heart doesn't beat for God. His heart doesn't have room for God. His heart doesn't orient towards God. And so when he needs God, he just wants God to get him out of a jam. That's all he cares about. When his neck is on the line, when his kingdom as a king's on the line, then he wants God, right? This is what Ralph Davies says. If you persistently refuse to hear God's speech, someday you will endure his silence. It's not just a principle for Saul. It's a principle for you and I. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the book of Hebrews chapter 13 says. That's the same God then as we deal with today. He's just as real then as He is today. And if we don't orient our lives and, and build a sensitivity of a conscience in our soul towards God, we won't find rest in God, right? That's what Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees for. What are you hypocrites and Pharisees? 
First clean out the inside of your cup, your heart. Then the outside will be clean too, your behavior. It's a heart orientation first. That's what Jesus says. So what's the, what's the solution? Psalms 105.4, look to the Lord and His strength. You can easily memorize this. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always, Psalms 105.4. Look to the Lord. That's the principle. And His strength. But what's the first part? Looking to the Lord. His face before His hand. Okay? We don't want to be like Saul. We don't want to fall like Saul, right? First Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14 says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. It was a heart issue. It is always a heart issue with us. And we constantly have to guard our heart to stick with Jesus, right? So I want you to think a little bit about, is your heart Godward? And what that would look like is spending time in this book. Spending time in prayer. That's partially about talking, but it's also partially about sitting and listening to God in your heart. What the Spirit's telling you. You don't just talk the whole time. You don't just talk at God or talk to God. That's a big part of it. But you also sit and listen to God. I'm not being weird here. I'm just telling you what, the, what, G, what David did in the Psalms. He does it all the time. We have to have that relationship with God, right? Second of all, we must learn to trust and obey God as a lifestyle and not give in to fear. We need to learn to trust and obey God as a lifestyle. Remember, it's a heart issue and not give in to fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. It destroys our faith. And it's okay to be afraid, but we have to overcome that with our faith, right? Now, what does the text say? Verse 4, the Philistine army assembled. They got all together and all this stuff. When Saul saw the Philistine's army, he was what? Afraid. Terror filled his heart. Now, that's pretty afraid. I already told you how they were trying to cut him in half, right? Cut his army in half. And so he's now having this problem of, of this very real reality in his life of the, the Philistines standing up and trying to cut off his forces, his northern tribes from him. And what you see in the life of David, when you juxtaposition him, is David always goes back to the Lord. David goes to the priest and says, seek the Lord for me. He goes to the prophets and says, seek the Lord for me. Ask the Lord whether I should attack the Philistines. Ask the Lord. We're going to see next week in the chapter 29 of a Ziklag. Ask the Lord. He does that all the time. He has a Godward heart. And because he has a Godward heart, and because his God is big in his heart and his mind, he's willing to do what God says because he knows God's power is behind him. And so his faith overcomes his fear. And so we have to train ourselves to be doing this all the time. But what does is, what is Saul do instead? We just looked at it. He goes and he says, find a woman who's a medium so that I may go and inquire of her. His fear gets the upper hand. And he goes to the medium, the witch of Endor, and he says, whoever I ask you to call up, call up. Who do you want? I want Samuel. Call him up. And he does it. And then she's kind of freaked out, right? She kind of shrieks when he actually shows up. I think she's used to kind of conning people a lot, as most of those people do today. I think she's used to conning people, right? That they say, oh, I hear from, from your dead husband, or I, I hear from your dead lover, or I hear from your dead father or something, and the con job is what she's used to. But in the text before us, that's not what she gets this time, right? It says in verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried. It means she shrieked out in a loud voice at the top of her lungs and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? She's freaked out. And then, of course, Samuel shows up, and he tells the horrible deed. He gives the truth to, to Saul, right? And so when we deal with this story, as believers, we have to ask ourselves, okay, we know the Scripture says you can have nothing to do with this. And so we know the heart of Saul is evil, and he's wrong, and he's doing evil. And he goes to the witch of Endor, and he seeks this from her, and so he calls up Samuel, but it brings up a lot of questions, right? A lot of questions. Yeah, fear is what's driving Saul. It puts us, when we're afraid, in compromising situations spiritually. Now, as believers, do you know of any believers that have done something like this in real life in our day and age? One of my favorite presidents his wife, who was a Christian, did this. Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan was known to be a strong believer in Christ. And when she couldn't figure something out, she would consult the stars, astrology. Can you believe that nonsense? 
Now, I love Mrs. Reagan, but that kind of garbage has no place with God's people. You don't consult astrology. You don't consult the Chinese zodiac. You don't consult all these different things, your horoscope. You don't do those things because God tells us not to do that stuff, right? And so when we look at this, we see her doing this seance. She's engaging this. And what? don't be afraid, verse 13. What do you see? This man comes forth, Samuel. And so what do we do with these questions, right? Different questions came to my head as I studied this. Can we consult the dead? Can we consult the dead? As believers, Saul, God's king, he's consulting the dead. Can we consult the dead? Well, we've already dealt with that. Deuteronomy says no. No necromancy, that's talking to the dead, dealing with the dead. No divination, no witchcraft, no any of that stuff. Sorcery, all that stuff. So that brings up another question. If Christians are not supposed to be engaged in those things and Saul's doing something evil here, then the next question is, in our life today, what about when we deal with those things? Should we deal with the occult? The answer is no. We should have nothing to do with the occult. Should we do Ouija boards and seances and those kinds of things? The answer is no. You should not because this is what happens is you open the door for the devil and evil forces to engage your soul. Now that sounds like a suicide mission to me. It's also the reason you don't do drugs. Drugs open up your heart and your soul when you're out of consciousness for the devil's influence. Not only do they do horrible things to your body, but they open up your heart and your soul for the devil's influence to enter in too. If you don't believe that's true, you should talk to some people with some drug problems. They'll tell you about all kinds of bad visions and stuff and being told to do all kinds of things. And demons will take the opportunity to get to you, right? And so you shouldn't have anything to do with those things. Well, what about, what about this? This is the other one I hear. What about in fantasy life? I mean, some of us are big fans of, of people like uh, the warthogs, right? We're big fans of, of all those kind of different series, Harry Potter and other things like that, Tolkien stuff. Lord of the Rings. Is that okay to engage in? Well, each Christian's got to measure these things by taking the scriptures and praying about it and asking the, Lord's, asking the Lord's direction on that and what you should do with your children and you guys. But fantasy, imagination is one thing, and reality is another. And when we engage in true occult and seances and divination and sorcery in real time, going and getting your palms read and all that nonsense, you get yourself in a harm's way with the devil. But when you engage in fantasy and you separate reality from fantasy, then that's different because that's just fun. That's just play and nobody knows that that's real. It's when you start to cross the two that we get into problems. Do you understand? Sometimes we take it from fantasy and we cross it over into reality. And you'll go to these things, right? Right? Many of us are big fans of Star Trek or something. You go to these trekkie thong kind of things, right? And everybody dresses up like Spock or, you know, whoever. And you do all these crazy things, and it's fun. It's just fun. It's just enjoyable, right? But every once in a while at one of those little Comic-Cons or Trek things or whatever else, you meet one of those guys that thinks that he's Spock. And you go out to dinner with him or something like that, and it's like, greetings, you know, and all this stuff and everything, and it's like it never turns off, and you're like, okay, you've passed over from fantasy into you're just a freak. You're just weird. And so, honey, maybe you and I shouldn't be having dinner with this guy again, because he's just, he's out to lunch. It's when we cross the two that we get into a big issue. And so that's, that's some of those questions that come up, but also the question is, what is this really Samuel? Is this really God's holy prophet that's showing up in this evil practice by this medium of divination? Those are the hard questions of the text that we can't just let go. We've got to be honest and deal with them. So I think that we should, we should deal with those this morning. So this is, what the, this is what you would find throughout church history to deal with this. Tertullian, the great church father, said this, God forbid that we should believe that any soul, much less the prophet Samuel, should be called forth by a demon. That was his opinion. Martin Luther in the Reformation said, 
Who could believe that the souls of believers who are in the hand of God, in the bosom of Abraham, paradise, were under the power of the devil? So he agreed with Tertullian. John Calvin added, God would never allow his prophets to be subjugated to such diabolical conjuring as if the devil had the power over the bodies and souls of the saints which are in God's keeping. That's the seemingly overwhelming agreement of much of the ancient church fathers. We could buy into that, we could go along with that, but we still have to deal with this text. And in the text it says, verse 16, that Samuel said. Now, just a plain reading of the text says that Samuel was the one that was speaking. This ghostly apparition was Samuel. So I don't know what Tertullian and Martin Luther and John Calvin did with that. Obviously, they tried to explain it away, and that's fine. They're great men of the faith. But in this event, was this truly, truly Samuel? Contrary to the historical great subjections, I think there's good reasons to believe that this event occurred and that this was indeed Samuel. And I'm going to explain to you why, okay? This is why. Number one, the text clearly says, okay, the woman, the witch of Endor, she wasn't expecting him, and when he showed up, she freaked and screamed. Ugh. Samuel, it says Samuel says, he speaks. And then Saul recognizes him as Samuel, probably because of the robe, and Saul talks to him. And so everything in the inspired text says that this was indeed Samuel that came up from the dead. Everything it says... Samuel said to Saul, verse 15, right? Verse 16, Samuel said, everything says it's Samuel. So how do we run from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing this down word for word in the biblical text that this was Samuel? We can't. That's the first thing we've got to deal with. The second thing we've got to deal with that I think tells you that this was Samuel too is that he is upset, right? Verse 15, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? If this was a demon, he'd be saying, good job, way to go. But Samuel's like, what are you doing? This is wrong. That was basically the essence of that. Why are you calling me up? This is a no-no, Saul. You know better. If I was around, I'd be kicking you in the teeth. And so we have to deal with the fact that, that Samuel says, why did you call me up? And third, the message of Samuel says that it's from God and not from a demon. What's the message of Samuel? Samuel says, guess what? What I told you before is going to come true, right? What I told you before is going to come true. Samuel, verse 16. Why did you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he's predicted through me. That's when he was alive. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. That's exactly the same message that he gave Saul all the way back in chapter 16. The same message that he said, you didn't obey him by wiping out King Agag and the Amalekites, and so God's going to tear it away from you and give it to David. This is the message of the Lord. No demon's going to de deliver the message of the Lord and make the Lord look good. And so what we have here is a legitimate account where Samuel is called up. Everything agrees with this. The inspired author agrees with this. The summoned spirit looks and acts like Samuel, and he speaks of Samuel, and then his message is legitimate. Everything points to it being Samuel. So this brings up another question. Does this mean, if it's actually Samuel the spirit, that an evil witch brought up Samuel the spirit, one who entered into death under God's care? That's the next question is, if this is Samuel, you mean some spiritist, some, some witch, some practicing sorcerer can call up God's people from the dead? And the answer is no. No, they cannot. Well then, pastor, then how come it happens here? And the reason it happens here is because God allowed an exception to the rule because Saul didn't get it. Saul's the thick-headed dude. Saul didn't get it when Samuel was standing right in front of him and said, this is what's going to happen. Saul, okay, fine, boom. Continue living like I was living. Samuel keeps telling him stuff. Saul doesn't get it. Saul's not going to understand unless 
a spirit comes back and tells him. And so Saul, Saul is the original Ebenezer Scrooge. Did you ever think about that? Saul is the original Ebenezer Scrooge from the Christmas story by Dickens, right? Ebenezer Scrooge knows what's right. He's not going to do it. But he's got to have the ghost show up and kind of kick him around, the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future, before he finally gets himself straight. And God has to send Samuel back from the dead, even through an evil means, so that he gets the point. And you know what? You would have thought that Saul would have right there and then did what? Repented. Turned away from that and turned back to God. But does Saul do that? No. The text says that Saul just trembles. So verse 20, immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with what? Fear. He's not filled with faith. Everything about this passage says they're afraid, they're afraid, they're afraid, they're afraid. And instead of turning to God in faith, he goes further down his own road into fear. And so that's the end of the lesson for us. The big lesson is that when we pursue a life without God, we end up in fear instead of in faith. Did you catch that? When we pursue a life without God, when we're not Godward centered, when our heart's not moving in that direction, we move into a life of fear instead of faith. And eventually the end of fear is a horrible, horrible place for us. It's a horrible place. If you don't believe so, think of some people with different disorders, that fear grips them and owns their life. And that sometimes when they finally believe that God's got all of it in His control, that they're released from the grip of that fear. Saul just plunges further and further and further. And so that even though this is an unexpected, unique time of the will of God to allow this one time for someone to come up from the dead, it's still doesn't move Saul's heart off center back towards God. He plunges more in his direction. Matthew Henry, the great Puritan pastor, writes this about it. God permitted on this one occasion the soul of a departed prophet to come as a witness from heaven. From heaven. Right? To send him and to confirm the word that God had spoken to Saul on the earth. That is the key. It's not to be repeated. And sometimes we're thick-headed, but sometimes it overcomes us. But, but Saul's filled with fear, verse 20. And that is the opposite. That's not how we as believers are supposed to operate. 1 Timothy 1.7 says, God did not give us a spirit of what? Of fear. But of love and of power and of a sound mind. Right? 2 Timothy 1.7. I quoted it wrong. 2 Timothy 1.7. And so we're not supposed to be living a life of fear, but, but Saul does. And so when you, or when you live a godless, non-godward life that's oriented on yourself or something else, when it's time to hear from God, you can't do it. And when it's time to have more faith, you can't get it. And you plunge headlong into destruction, into fear, just like Saul, which leads us to our next point. We need to see repentance as more important than religion. Saul should have been driven to his knees to cry out to God. He should have done that. In fact, I've said to you before that if Saul changed his heart and he truly repented, now repentance means you truly change directions completely heart mind soul and spirit everything moves towards god away from whatever else you trust in yourself or anything else if saul had truly done that god would change it and i'll tell you why you guys can go home and look this up i may give it to you next week but i want you to dig in the scriptures a little bit if you look in first and second kings and first and second chronicles you're going to find two kings that were horribly against god and then they finally have a small moment of contrition, of true repentance. And guess what? God shows up big on their behalf. God would do the same thing for Saul, but Saul's heart never gets there. His needle never gets off empty. It never moves in God's direction. But if we would have found repentance, instead of trying to practice religion, he would have been fine, right? But he doesn't look like a repentant guy. Even though he's acting sorry, even though he weeps, even though he does religious things, he's not truly repentant. He's just going through the motions. He has a tragic, godless heart. And so he never truly repents. And so I want you to think about this. Do you know how? This is what we should learn from Saul. Do you know how to repent? That seems like an old term, but it's a great term, and so I'm not going to change it. Do you know how to repent? Let me give you five signs that you're not repenting, okay? This will help you understand when you're not doing that. Number one, you can write these down. When you rationalize and blame shift. When you rationalize and blame shift. When you justify. Well, you know, Greg, the reason I'm engaging in that sin is because of this. 
That's rationalization. Well, Greg, I understand what you're saying, but the reason I'm engaging this is this. You don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand how loveless my marriage is. You don't understand how tough my kids are. You don't understand the draw of this addiction. You don't understand whatever it is. You can put whatever you want in there. But at the end of the day, you begin to explain away why you're engaging in a particular sin. You justify, you minimize, you rationalize. Sometimes you flat out deny that you're doing it. I remember one time having this guy in our church back in Carl Springs in my office. His wife had found all the text messages and pictures of his lover outside of their marriage. So she had copied them onto a hard drive, brought them in. We'd printed them out. He had decided to come in for marital counseling. And when she confronted him with all this, he literally sat there and said, I've never had a fear in my life. I don't know who this woman is. Then how come your naked arms are wrapped around her in this picture? Explain that to me, to which he sat there and never gave an explanation. But sometimes when we're caught in our sin and we don't want to repent, we'll go so far down that we'll deny. Not just justify and minimize, but to deny that we're doing it. And if you see these things, blame shifting. His, his next words were, well, Greg, when we finally got through all the layers of denial, it's not my fault, it is her fault. Shifting blame. Why is it her fault? Well, you don't understand, she's not a good wife. She didn't do this, and she didn't do this, and we don't have this, and we don't have that, and we don't have that. What does that got to do with you doing these things with this woman? Well, it's her fault, and it, over and over for the next two hours, he shifted it back onto his wife. He never quite in that session got to the place where he was ready to deal with his own sin. I got to tell you, two hours of that, I was exhausted as a counselor. I was wiped out when I came home. Man, that's craziness, right? So that's one of those signs you look at. The second one is confession is not repentance. Confession is not repentance. Confession is good for the soul. We're commanded to confess our sins to each other, but it's not repentance. It's not change, right? Just because you confess your sins doesn't mean you repented of them. You may have just been getting something off your chest. Often when we unload the, the whole baggage, we feel better, right? But godly sorrow is sorrow that your sin has done something to God. That your sin is wicked. That it affects other people and it moves us to change behavior. Worldly sorrow arises for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes we're sorry because we get caught. The kid with his hand in the cookie jar, right? Did you take the cookie? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Sometimes at 55, we're the same as we are at 5, believe it or not. Sometimes we just started to be caught. Sometimes we're healing from shame. Sometimes we're guilty and trying to get that off our chest. Sometimes it's self-pity, but these are not self-repentance. These are not repentance before God. Godly sorrow results in a change of attitude towards God and a permanent change in your life. Write it down. Godly repentance means you change your attitude towards God and I have a permanent change in your life. That's what true repentance is. You don't measure godly sorrow by the strength of your emotion, but by the power and the lasting effect of your change. By the power and the lasting effect of your change. Third, conditional obedience. God, I'll do this if you do that, right? I'll obey you if you do this. It's the quid pro quo question, right? God, if, if I do these things, then I'll do that. If you do these things, I'll do that. Well, we just talked about that. If I, if I go to church, if I tithe, if I give, if I work, if I serve, if I worship, if I read my Bible, then God, you got to show up like this. That's not how it works. If I do these things with my wife, da -da 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 -da, she doesn't have to do this. That's not how it works. Her heart may be moved to do this because she's thankful and gracious and kind, but she's not obligated, and God isn't either. It's not conditioned, right, on our obedience. How about partial compliance? Real repentance is shown not in emotional catharsis, but in a changed life. You don't get to repent and say, yeah, I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and you partially change. That was Saul. He partially obeyed God. God said, wipe out the Amalekites. Well, I wipe out all the bad guys, but I keep the king to make myself look good, and all their loot and good I keep. Partial obedience doesn't work out. 
In fact, the scripture says it is better to obey than to offer up a sacrifice to God. Partial obedience isn't going to cut the day. That's not true repentance, right? Or what about the absence of godly sorrow? 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. We've already looked at that. I, it's important for us to not fake our repentance. Repentance instead is full trust in God and complete satisfaction in God that leads to full surrender or yielding to God. And so as we end this sermon this morning, I think there's some takeaways for us with Saul. First of all, do we have a Godward life? I don't mean does everything depend upon God? Does everything focus on God? Does everything point towards God? No, but the more of it that it does, the better. God should be part of every part of your life. Every part of your life. Do you really think or do I really think that I can hide something from the Lord? What's the chances of hiding from the Almighty? Not very good, right? God knows if we have a Godward heart, and He rewards that. When you honor God, He honors you. Okay? Second of all, when we have a Godward life, we don't move in fear. We move in faith, right? We move not in fear, but in faith. And we took away a lot of lessons from the whole divination thing. It's bad. Don't engage in it. It'll get demons on you. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And third, and last, we need to be people of repentance. As believers, Repentance should be part of our daily lifestyle. It's not old news. It's the good news. Amen? It is not old news. It is the good news of the gospel, where Jesus said, repent and believe. We need to repent on a regular basis. I have sinned in my life. I sinned this morning. I sinned last night. Horrible, horrible, horrible sin. But whatever it is, I need to bring to the Lord. I need to confess it. And I need to ask for his forgiveness, and then I need to ask for the Holy Spirit's empowering to not do it again. And I may have to do that over and over and over, but if I'm moving in the direction of God, and I'm really trying to have permanent change, eventually I'm going to get there, amen? These are the things that we should take away from this episode. When you read parts of the Scripture that seem obscure, I want you to be thinking a little bit about all Scripture is God-breathed. It comes from God. And it's profitable for teaching and correction and rebuking of our sins and training in righteousness. So what am I supposed to get from this crazy, weird passage? I think we've proven today that you can get a lot from the life of Saul, right? And when we see the juxtaposition of David last week, Saul this week, and then David again next week, it's going to come into a brighter sphere. Now we're going to finish with this. Saul in this passage collapses on the floor in fear. And he says, you need to eat something. You're weak. And he says he hasn't eaten all day. So she goes out and kills the fatted calf, gets his cronies to talk him into it. And Saul, in his sin, his non-repentance, his evil, his whatever, his lack of faith, his fear, all those things, his self-focused life, goes and fills his face with the fatted calf and the unleavened bread. He has, as you read through the rest of the book of Samuel, his last supper. He's going to die. Tomorrow, him and his sons are going to die in battle with the Philistines. It's his last supper. Because when we act like Saul, when we're non-repentance, when we're non-Godward, when we're people of fear instead of faith, because of living life without God, it was Jesus on his last night that had his last supper too. Jesus, because of your sin and mine, chose to set his face in his perfection, in his almightiness, in his godliness, in his Godward life that was perfectly Godward, that was filled with faith. He didn't have to repent of sin because he didn't have it, but he gladly forgave other people who did. Because of our lives, the Holy One of God, the Son of God, had his last meal with his friends too. It also was filled with unleavened bread, but there was no fatted calf. It was simple, dry, unrisen bread and a little bit of wine. And that night he would be betrayed by one of his own, the 12, Judas. And he would be falsely imprisoned and falsely accused and have a mock trial. And he would be crucified within a day and something. And he would be on the tree 
in the place of you and I. And guess who Jesus died for? Jesus died for the souls of this world. And guess who that is? That's you and I. We are the souls. Left without God, we're going to get just as bad as Saul. The seeds of our destruction lie within our depravity within our souls. And any time we lie to ourselves and say we're good and great and all that, we're doing a disservice and we're blaspheming the blood of Christ. Now, we may be good, we may be great, but it's because of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's because we have accepted the free gift of eternal life. It is because we are now with Jesus Christ and because His goodness flows through us. Otherwise, there is no goodness in us. If you don't believe that, read Romans chapter 1 and 2. Read Ecclesiastes 7.20. There is no one righteous on the earth who does what is good. No, not one. But because of Jesus Christ in our life, because of the good news, we're different creatures. That's why it's good news. Because when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, up himself as a great sacrifice, which the bread represents his body, and the blood, in this case, the wine for us represents his blood, right? Those wine and the, and the juice represent his blood, and those things tell us something about it. He had to shed his blood. He had to break his perfect body in our place to pay the full penalty for God's wrath against our sins. And then, to give us the exchange life, his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin. That's our sin, right? He took our sins upon himself on the tree. So that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the beautiful thing. The exchange life. As we go into the invitation time, I want you to think a little bit. Right after that, we're going to engage in the Lord's Supper. We're going to partake in communion. Okay? During that time of the of the invitation. This is your time to do business with Jesus, and I want you to ask yourself this. Where am I at with God right now? Do I have a Godward life? Do I engage in repentance? Am I living a life of faith? Maybe I've never participated in those things. Maybe I've never come to Christ. Now is your time to come and say, I need this relationship with Christ that you're talking about. I need to be able to have something with Jesus to do these things. You come. I'll be happy to share Christ with you. So will Steve. So, will Brad, we'd be happy to share Christ with you. Today could be the day of salvation for you, if you've never had that before. To be saved from your sins and the penalty of your sins and have Christ's life deposited in your soul. But if you're a believer, maybe the Lord wants you to deal with some sin in your life, and let's be honest with ourselves, we are good about knowing what our sin is. We just like to put it underneath the shelf, right? Before we take of the Lord's Supper, something that Paul said is, should not come to the table unworthily. Instead, that we should confess our sins. Now is your time to do 